Latin for Beginners by Benjamin L. Doge, PhD. Read for the LibriVox Language Learning Collection, Volume 4, by Matthew Knight. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Preface To make the course preparatory to Caesar at the same time systematic, thorough, clear and interesting is the purpose of this series of lessons. The first page is devoted to a brief discussion of the Latin language, its history, and its educational value. The body of the book, consisting of 79 lessons, is divided into three parts. Part 1 is devoted to pronunciation, quantity, accent, and kindred introductory essentials. Part 2 carries the work through the first 60 lessons, and is devoted to the study of forms and vocabulary, together with some elementary constructions, a knowledge of which is necessary for the translation of the exercises and reading matter. The first few lessons have been made unusually simple, to meet the wants of pupils not well grounded in English grammar. Part 3 contains 19 lessons and is concerned primarily with the study of syntax and of subjunctive and irregular verb forms. The last three of these lessons constitute a review of all the constructions presented in the book. There is abundant easy reading matter, and, in order to secure proper concentration of effort upon syntax and translation, no new vocabularies are introduced, but the vocabularies in Part 2 are reviewed. It is hoped that the following features will commend themselves to teachers. The forms are presented in their natural sequence, and are given for the most part in the body of the book, as well as in a grammatical appendix. The work on the verb is intensive in character, work in other directions being reduced to a minimum while this is going on. The forms of the subjunctive are studied in correlation with the subjunctive constructions. The vocabulary has been selected with the greatest care, using the largest dictionary of secondary Latin and Brown's Latin word list as a basis. There are about 600 words, exclusive of proper names, in the special vocabularies, and these are among the simplest and commonest words in the language. More than 95% of those chosen are Caesarean, and of these, more than 90% are used in Caesar five or more times. The few words not Caesarean are of such frequent occurrence in Cicero, Virgil, and other authors as to justify their appearance here. But teachers desiring to confine word study to Caesar can easily do so, as the Caesarean words are printed in the vocabularies in distinctive type. Concrete nouns have been preferred to abstract, root words to compounds and derivatives, even when the latter were of more frequent occurrence than Caesar. To assist the memory, related English words are added in each special vocabulary. To ensure more careful preparation, the special vocabularies have been removed from their respective lessons and placed by themselves. The general vocabulary contains about 1,200 words, and of these, above 85% are found in Caesar. The syntax has been limited to those essentials which recent investigations, such as those of Dr. Lee Byrne and his collaborators, have shown to belong properly to the work of the first year. The constructions are presented as far as possible from the standpoint of English, the English usage being given first, and the Latin compared or contrasted with it. Special attention has been given to the constructions of participles, the gerund and gerund dive, and the infinitive in indirect statements. Constructions having a logical connection are not separated but are treated together. Exercises for translation occur throughout, those for translation into Latin being, as a rule, only half as long as those for translation into English. In Part 3, a few of the commoner idioms in Caesar are introduced, and the sentences are drawn mainly from that author. From first to last, a consistent effort is made to instill a proper regard for Latin word order, the first principles of which are laid down early in the course. Selections for reading are unusually abundant, and are introduced from the earliest possible moment. These increase in number and length as the book progresses, and, for the most part, are made an integral part of the lessons, instead of being massed at the end of the book. This arrangement ensures a more constant and thorough drill in forms and vocabulary, promotes reading power, and affords a breathing spell between succeeding subjects. The material is drawn from historical and mythological sources, and the vocabulary employed includes but few words not already learned. The book closes with a continued story which recounts the chief incidents in the life of a Roman boy. The last chapters record his experiences in Caesar's army, and contain much information that will facilitate the interpretation of the commentaries. The early emphasis placed on word order and sentence structure, the simplicity of the syntax, and the familiarity of the vocabulary make the reading selection especially useful for work in sight translation. Reviews are called for at frequent intervals, and to facilitate this branch of the work, an appendix of reviews has been prepared, covering both the vocabulary and the grammar. The illustrations are numerous, and will, it is hoped, do much to stimulate interest in the ancient world and to create true and lasting impressions of Roman life and times. A consistent effort has been made to use simple language and clear explanation throughout. As an aid, the teachers using this book as a teacher's manual has been prepared, which contains, in addition to general suggestions, notes on each lesson. 
The author wishes to express his gratitude to the numerous teachers who tested the advanced pages in their classes, and, as a result of their experience, have given much valuable aid by criticism and suggestion. Particular acknowledgments are due to Miss A. Susan Jones of the Central High School, Grand Rapids, Michigan, to Miss Clara Addison of the High School at Hastings, Michigan, and to Miss Helen B. Muir and Mr. Orland O. Norris, teachers of Latin in this institution. Benjamin L. Doge, Michigan State Normal College. End of Flash and Four Beginners, Section 1, Preface, by Benjamin L. Doge, Recording by Matthew Knight. Latin for Beginners, by Benjamin L. Doge, Ph.D., read for the LibriVox Language Learning Connection, Volume 4, by Matthew Knight. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. To the Student, by way of introduction. What is Latin? If you will look at the map of Italy on the opposite page, you will find near the middle of the peninsula and facing the west coast a district called Latium, and Rome its capital. The Latin language, meaning the language of Latium, was spoken by the ancient Romans and other inhabitants of Latium, and Latin was the name applied to it after the armies of Rome had carried the knowledge of her language far beyond its original boundaries. As the English of today is not quite the same as that spoken two or three hundred years ago, so Latin was not always the same at all times, but changed more or less in the course of centuries. The sort of Latin you are going to learn was in use about 2,000 years ago, and that period has been selected because the language was then at its best, and the greatest works of Roman literature were being produced. This period, because of its supreme excellence, is called the Golden Age of Roman Letters. The Spread of Latin For some centuries after Rome was founded, the Romans were a feeble and insignificant people. Their territory was limited to Latium, and their existence constantly threatened by warlike neighbours. But after the third century before Christ, Rome's power grew rapidly. She conquered all Italy, then reached out for the lands across the sea and beyond the Alps, and finally ruled over the whole ancient world. The empire thus established lasted for more than 400 years. The importance of Latin increased with the growth of Roman power, and what had been a dialect spoken by a single tribe became the universal language. Gradually the language changed somewhat, developing differently in different countries. In Italy it has become Italian, in Spain, Spanish, and in France, French. All these nations, therefore, are speaking a modernized form of Latin. The Romans and the Greeks In their career of conquest, the Romans came into conflict with the Greeks. The Greeks were inferior to the Romans in military power, but far superior to them in culture. They excelled in art, literature, music, science, and philosophy. Of all these pursuits, the Romans were ignorant until contact with Greeks revealed to them the value of education and filled them with a thirst for knowledge. And so it came about that while Rome conquered Greece by force of arms, Greece conquered Rome by force of her intellectual superiority, and became a schoolmaster. It was soon the established custom for young Romans to go to Athens, and to other centres of Greek learning to finish their training, and the knowledge of the Greek language among the educated classes became universal. At the same time, many cultured Greeks, poets, artists, orators and philosophers, flocked to Rome, opened schools, and taught their arts. Indeed, the preeminence of Greek culture became so great that Rome almost lost her ambition to be original, and her writers vied with each other in their efforts to reproduce in Latin what was choicest in Greek literature. As a consequence of all this, the civilization and national life of Rome became largely Grecian, and to Greece she owed her literature and her art. Rome and the Modern World After conquering the world, Rome impressed her language, laws, customs of living, and modes of thinking upon the subject nations, and they became Roman, and the world has remained largely Roman ever since. Latin continued to live, and the knowledge of Latin was the only light of learning that burned steadily through the Dark Ages that followed the downfall of the Roman Empire. Latin was the common language of scholars, and remained so even down to the days of Shakespeare. Even yet, it is more nearly than any other tongue the universal language of the learned. The life of today is much nearer the life of ancient Rome than the lapse of centuries would lead one to suppose. You and I are Romans still in many ways and if Caesar and Cicero should appear among us, we should not find them, except for dress and language, much unlike men of today. Latin and English Do you know that more than half of the words in the English dictionary are Latin, and that you are speaking more or less Latin every day? How has this come about? In the year 1066, William the Conqueror invaded England with an army of Normans. The Normans spoke French, which, you remember, is descended from Latin 
and spread the language to a considerable extent over England, and so Norman French played an important part in the formation of English, and forms a large proportion of our vocabulary. Furthermore, great numbers of almost pure Latin words have been brought into English through the writing of scholars, and every new scientific discovery is marked by the addition of new terms of Latin derivation. Hence, while the simpler and commoner words of our mother tongue are Anglo-Saxon, and Anglo-Saxon forms the staple of our colloquial language, yet in the realms of literature, and especially in poetry, words of Latin derivation are very abundant. Also in the learned professions, as in law, medicine, and engineering, a knowledge of Latin is necessary for the successful interpretation of technical and scientific terms. Why study Latin? The foregoing paragraphs make it clear why Latin forms so important a part of modern education. We have seen that our civilization rests upon that of Greece and Rome, and that we must look to the past if we would understand the present. It is obvious, too, that the knowledge of Latin not only leads to a more exact and effective use of our own language, but that it is of vital importance and of great practical value to anyone preparing for a literary or professional career. To this it may be added that the study of Latin throws a flood of light upon the structure of language in general, and lays an excellent foundation for all grammatical study. Finally, it has been abundantly proved that there is no more effective means of strengthening the mind than by the earnest pursuit of this branch of learning. Review Questions Whence does Latin get its name? Where is Latium? Where is Rome? Was Latin always the same? What sort of Latin are we to study? Describe the growth of Rome's power and the spread of Latin. What can you say of the origin of Italian, French and Spanish? How did the ancient Greeks and Romans compare? How did Greece influence Rome? How did Rome influence the world? In what sense are we Romans still? What did Latin have to do with the formation of English? What proportion of English words are of Latin origin, and what kind of words are they? Why should we study Latin? End of Latin for Beginners Section 2 To the Students by Way of Introduction By Benjamin L. Doge Recording by Matthew Knight Latin for Beginners by Benjamin L. Doge Read for the LibriVox Language Learning Connection, Volume 4, by Matthew Knight. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Pronunciation of Latin The Alphabet The Latin alphabet contains the same letters as the English, except that it has no W and no J. The vowels, as in English, are A, E, I, O, U, Y. The other letters are consonants. I is used both as a vowel and as a consonant. Before a vowel in the same syllable, it has the value of a consonant and is called I consonant. Thus, in Julius, the first I is a consonant, the second a vowel. Sounds of the letters. Footnote. The sounds of the letters are best learned by hearing them correctly pronounced. The matter in this section is, therefore, intended for reference, rather than for assignment as a lesson. As a first step, it is suggested that the teacher pronounce the examples in class, the pupils following. Latin was not pronounced like English. The Romans at the beginning of the Christian era pronounced their language substantially, as described below. The vowels have the following sounds. Long A, as in father. Short A, like the first R in aha, never as in hat. Long E, as in they. Short e as in met, long i as in machine, short i as in bit, long o as in holy, short o as in holy, never as in hot, long u as in rude, short u as in full. It is to be observed that there is a decided difference in sound, except in the case of o, between the long and the short vowels. It is not merely a matter of quantity, but also of quality. Transcriber's note. In this version of the text, long vowels are shown with a circumflex accent, and short vowels are unmarked, as described in the introductory notes. In diphthongs, two vowel sounds, both vowels are heard in a single syllable. A-E as in aisle, A-U as in out, E-I as in eight, E-U as U, O-E as in toil, U-I as in ui. Give all the vowels and diphthongs their proper sounds, and do not slur over them in unaccented syllables, as is done in English. Consonants are pronounced as in English, except that C is always like K in cat, never as in scent. G is always like G 
in git, never as in gem. The I consonant is always like Y in yes. N before C, Q, U, or G is like N in sing. Q, U, G, U, and sometimes S, U before a vowel have the sound of Q, W, G, W, and S, W. Here, U has the value of consonant V and is not counted a vowel. Inquit, qui, lingua, sanguis, suadeo. S is like s in C, never as in ease. T is always like t in native, never as in nation. V is like W in wine, never as in vine. X has the value of two consonants, CS or GS, and is like x in extract, not as in exact. BS is like PS, and BT like PT. CH, PH, and TH are like C. P and T, respectively. And combinations of consonants give each its distinct sound. Double consonants should be pronounced with a slight pause between the two sounds, thus pronounced TT as in rat trap, not as in rattle, PP as in hop pull, not as in upper. Example, mito, apius, bellum. Syllables. A Latin word has as many syllables as it has vowels and diphthongs, thus, aestate has three syllables. Audiendus has four. Two vowels with a consonant between them never make one syllable, as is so often the case in English. Compare English inside with Latin incide. Words are divided into syllables as follows. A single consonant between two vowels goes with the second, thus amabilis, memoria, interea, abist, parigit. Footnote. In writing and printing, it is customary to divide the parts of a compound as interia, abest, subactus, paregit, contrary to the correct phonetic rule. Combinations of two or more consonants. A consonant followed by L or R goes with the L or R, thus publicus, agri. Exception. Prepositional compounds of this nature, as also LL and RR, follow rule B. Rule B states that in all other combinations of consonants, the first consonant goes with the preceding vowel. Thus, manius, egestas, victoria, ospes, anus, subactus. Footnote. The combination NCT is divided nt, as in functus, sanctus. The last syllable of a word is called the ultima. The one next to the last, the penult. The one before the penult, the antepenult. Exercise. Divide the words in the following passage into syllables and pronounce them, placing the accent as indicated. Vade ad formicam o piger et considera vias eus et dice sepientiam, quecum non hebiat ducem nec preceptorum, Nec principe parat in, parat in aestate cibum sibe et congregat in messe quod comedat. In English, go to the ant, thou sluggard, consider her ways and be wise, which, having no guide, overseer or ruler, provideth her meat in the summer, and gathereth her food in the harvest. Quantity The quantity of a vowel or a syllable is the time it takes to pronounce it. Correct pronunciation and accents depend upon the proper observance of quantity. Vowels are either long or short. In this book, the long vowels are marked. Unmarked vowels are to be considered short. A vowel is short before another vowel, or H, as poeta, trau. A vowel is short before NT and ND, before final M or T, and, except in words of one syllable, before final L or R, thus amant, amandus, amabum, amabet. Animal. Amor. A vowel is long before NF, NS, NX, and NCT. Thus, infero, regens, sanxi, sanctus. Diphthongs are always long and are not marked. Syllables are either long or short, and their quantity must be carefully distinguished from that of vowels. A syllable is short if it ends in a short vowel, as amo pigri. 
Note, in final syllables, the short vowel may be followed by a final consonant. Thus, the word memoriam contains four short syllables. In the first three, a short vowel ends the syllable. In the last, the short vowel is followed by a final consonant. A syllable is long if it contains a long vowel or a diphthong, such as curo, poinai, aestate. If it ends in a consonant which is followed by another consonant, as corpus, manius. The vowel in a long syllable may be either long or short, and should be pronounced accordingly. Thus in terra, inter. The first syllable is long, but the vowel in each case is short and should be given the short sound. In words like saxum, the first syllable is long because x is the value of two consonants, cs or gs. In determining quantity, h is not counted as a consonant. Note: Give about twice as much time to the long syllables as to the short ones. It takes about as long to pronounce a short vowel plus a consonant as it does to pronounce a long vowel or a diphthong and so these quantities are considered equally long. For example, it takes about as long to say kuro as it does to say kuro, and so each of these first syllables is long. Compare molis and molis, amisi and amisi. Accent. Words of two syllables are accented on the first, as mensa, kaiser. Words of more than two syllables are accented on the penult, if the penult is long. If the penult is short, accent the antepenult. Thus, monemus, regitur, agricola, amandus. Note. Observe that the position of the accent is determined by the length of the syllable, and not by the length of the vowel in the syllable. Certain little words called enclitics, which have no separate existence, are added to and pronounced with the preceding word. The most common are gre, and, ve, o, and ne, the question sign. The syllable before an enclitic takes the accent, regardless of its quantity. Thus, populusque, deaque, regnave, auditne. Footnote. Enclitic means leaning back, and that is, as you see, just what these little words do. They cannot stand alone, and so they lean back for support upon the preceding word. How to read Latin. To read Latin well is not so difficult if you begin right. Correct habits of reading should be formed now. Notice the quantities carefully, especially the quantity of the penult, to ensure you're getting the accent on the right syllable. Give every vowel its proper sound and every syllable its proper length. Then bear in mind that we should read Latin as we read English, in phrases rather than in separate words. Group together words that are closely connected in thought. No good reader halts at the end of each word. Read the stanzas of the following poem by Longfellow, one at a time. First the English, and then the Latin version. The syllables enclosed in parentheses are to be slurred or omitted to secure smoothness of meter. Excelsior. Higher. The shades of night were falling fast, as though an alpine village passed. A youth, who bore, mid snow and ice, a banner with a strange device, Excelsior. Cadebans noctis umbrae, dum ibat per vicium alpicum, gerunveque adolescens, Vexudum cum signu ferens, excelsior. His brow was sad, his eye beneath, flashed like a falcon from its sheath, and like a silver clarion rum, the accents of that unknown tongue, excelsior. Frons tristis, micat oculus verut, evagina gladius, sonantque similis tubie accentus linguae, incognitiae, excelsior. In happy homes he saw the light of household fires gleam warm and bright. Above the spectral glaciers shone, and from his lips escaped a groan, Excelsior. In domibus vitet claras, for corum luces caridas, relucet glacies acris, et rumpit gemitus labris, Excelsior. Try not the pass, the old man said, dark low is the tempest overhead, the roaring torrent is deep and wide, and loud that clarion voice replied, Excelsior. Dicit senex, ne transias, supra nigeresit tempestas, latus et altus est torrens, clara venit vox respondens, Excelsior. At a break of day, as heavenward, the pious monks of St. Bernard uttered the oft-repeated prayer, a voice cried through the startled air, Excelsior.
lucescebat et fratre sancti Bernardi vigere solabant precessoritas, cum vox clamavates per oras, excelsio. A traveller by the faithful hound, half buried in the snow was found, still grasping in his hand of ice that banner with the strange device, excelsio. Semisepultis fiat orcanea fidura peritur, comprendens pugno gelido iult vexilum cum signo excelsior. There in the twilight, cold and grey, lifeless but beautiful he lay, and from the sky, serene and far, a voice fell like a falling star, excelsior. Yacet corpus examimum, sel luce frigida pulcrum, et celo procalexiens cadid vox, ut stella cadens, excelsior. Footnote. Translation by C. W. Goodchild, in Precio Latinus, October 1898. End of Latin for Beginners, by Benjamin L. Duge. Section 3. Pronunciation. Recording by Matthew Knight.